uh, hear me? Hear me fine? All right, sorry for, uh, I'm from out of town. I'm from Tucson. I still have Tucson time zone. So uh, that, that's when you know you're, you're having a good trip, right? You're, you're late for everything. All right, so speaking of uh, Tucson, I found out my um, Sam Rollins is uh, one of my classmates from the U of A. So if Sam, is, if you're still here, just hi. I hope we can talk later. All right, so my name is Mario Gonzalez, and I want to talk to you about regression testing, rethinking regression testing. But why do we need to talk about regression testing anymore? All right, it's, it's widely understood, it's widely used practice. Well, the reason is because of confidence, or, or rather the lack of confidence in our tests. Because even though we trust our tests 100%, we don't really know where their weak spots are, for example, or whether uh, they have blind spots in where they are. We don't know if we have over-tested an area of our product and left others under-tested and by how much, or whether we have left them untested completely. Okay. And, and some of you might be thinking, well, there's code coverage for that, right? Code coverage tells us a good, is a good indicator for, for uh, the quality of our tests. Well, not really. And, and let me show you some numbers, and, and I'll, I'll tell you where these numbers come from in a moment. So the average test suite, the average Ruby test suite, captures around 85% code coverage. Okay, that, that's not bad, right? And then in our sincere efforts to try to minimize those gaps, because we know the holes exist in our tests, we introduce redundancy in our tests, right? And these are, these are not exact duplicates of, of every, every test, exact copies. They are, they are tests that are testing ultimately the same thing, but doing it in, in widely different ways, right? So the average test suite has an average of 25% redundancy built in. And yet, the actual regression detection capability of, of our tests is only 55%. Okay? So is code coverage a good indicator of the quality of our tests? No, not really. It's good to have, but it's a second-order metric. Okay? It's a proxy metric. So where do these numbers come from? So the work I do in my company, or task is research and I research uh, focused on software quality. And the reason, uh, reason I started my company was because I, I noticed these, these, uh, this pattern in, in my own uh, projects and the projects of the, of the teams I was working with as well. And we were following best practices, like test-driven development and, and try, trying to achieve uh, high code coverage, and yet our projects were riddled with bugs. We're still riddled with bugs, right? So. Last year, uh, I finished two um, research projects, basically. One, one of them was focused on the effects of test redundancy, and that's where, that's where the um, redundancy and code coverage numbers are coming from. And, and I also finished a uh, still unpublished uh, study about uh, regression. Okay? And that's where the regression detection and code coverage are coming from. So they strengthen each other. So in... In this presentation, I want to focus on the regression detection capability of our test, how to, how to measure it accurately, and then how to improve it. Okay? And the way we're going to do that is with a technique called mutation testing, or mutation analysis. Okay? And I know there's been, um, in previous uh, conferences, there's been presentations about uh, mutation analysis. And, and, but I'm going to do it a little bit differently. I think you, you've already noticed because I'm, I'm going to be presenting the results of my research throughout the presentation. And, and my, my goal is that by the end of this presentation, you will be empowered to start using this more accurate metric to actually uh, assess the quality of your, of your tests and, and start improving them confidently. Okay? So let's start talking about why code coverage is unreliable. Okay? So suppose that the the, um, the graph you're, you're seeing right now, the curve, represents the, the evolution of your software as, as time goes by. Okay? So on the, on the x-axis, you have time, y-axis, lines of code. It's very simplistic, but it, it does the work. 
Okay? So suppose that we want to get the, the slope at a point on this curve. Would it be reasonable to expect that that slope would continue on forever? It wouldn't. And that's the analogous problem with code coverage. Code coverage is a point in time metric. Right? It tells you what your tests are covering right now, but it has no relevance to what they're going to cover tomorrow or a month from now, okay? because our software changes so much. And that's why code coverage feels like a, like a game of catch-up all the time, right? because we're, it's almost impossible to achieve 100% code coverage every single day. Okay? What we need is a better, a better way to assess the quality of our tests, and that, that's where mutation analysis comes in. That's where the mutation score, the associated mutation score, uh, shines. Okay. So let's talk about the mutation score. What is it? So the mutation score is a, is a ratio. It's actually a probability. Okay. You can have your worst score, which means that you have 0% probability of, detecting, of your, your test detecting regressions. Or you can have 1 or 100%, which is 100% probability of detecting regressions. This, of course, is the best score. And it's called mutation adequate. Okay? So there's mutation in the name mutation analysis. But what do we mutate? So mutation analysis is a type of fault injection. Well, we don't introduce new code, although we could. We actually change what's already there. We mutate the existing source code. And we leave our tests unmodified. Okay? Because we're going to test our tests. All right? It's kind of meta. Right? So for example, if in our... If in our source code we find an arithmetic operator, we change it, and we run our unmodified tests on, on, that, on that mutant. If one of our tests, at least one of our tests, fails, that's a good thing. We say that the mutant has been killed, and it means that our tests are, um, they have a high probability of detecting this kind of regression if we ever introduce this regression. Now, suppose we encounter a relational operator in our source code. Well, we change it, and we run our unmodified tests on that. Okay? Now, suppose that, well, let me, let me speak about this mutation, first of all. So this is an interesting mutation. This is a, 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 an instance of a class of, a, of a type of um, class of bugs called the off-by-one error. Right? So if, when we run our unmodified tests on, on this, if none of our tests fail, if all our tests pass, it means that our tests are inadequate. They have a low probability of detecting off-by-one errors in case we ever introduce them. Okay? And of course, we can flip the, the relational operator. So I'm going to have some more fun with Windows, I guess. I want to show you a, a demo. And I'm going to run here a... The mutation engine I use for my research I was telling you before. And okay. Alright, so a one run, one one mutant gives us a binary pass fail. Okay. That's that's I'll talk about that in a moment. But what I really want to show you right now is how a mutation looks. Okay. Oh, let's see. So on your left-hand side, you have the original. On the right-hand side, you have the, uh, the mutant. And where is it? There we go. The equal equal has been changed to a not equal. Okay. Now going back to, uh, to the mutation score. So of course, binary pass fail, 0, 1. To get, uh, like I said before, mutation analysis is a probabilistic technique. And if I didn't say it before, I'm saying it right now. It's a stochastic technique. So to, say, to, to get a better mutation score, a more accurate mutation score, we need to run it at least more times, okay? at least 50 times or so. So we'll leave it running for a while and, and come back to it later and see how it's doing. Okay. So how do we get the score? Well, the score, like I said before, is just a ratio. right? It's the total number of mutants killed or detected by your test divided by the total number of, of generated mutants. And mutation analysis is one of those very few techniques in software development that you can actually have fun with. 
because you can have mutants killed or zombies killed or ninjas killed, right? And, and the reason I'm trying to say this, the reason I'm saying this is because the more fun you have applying a technique, the more you will find yourself applying it consistently. And the more consistently you will improve your tests and therefore the quality of your software. Okay? So how many mutants should we, should we have? In, in, the, in the demo I just showed you, we had only one, uh, one uh, mutation. Okay? So should we have more than that? Should we mutate the entire source file and, and run with that? Well, let's, let's agree on something before. So let the, um, the mutation quantity, let it be represented by the variable k, the aptly named variable k. All right? So back when, when the research on mutation analysis was, was beginning, back in the 1970s, the original researchers made a big assumption. And this assumption has been validated, meaning that it has overwhelming uh, evidence in its favor by decades of research. Okay? Now, this assumption is, is one of two pillars making the foundation for mutation analysis. It's called the competent programmer hypothesis. Okay? And what it says is that experienced programmers create code that is almost there, almost correct. All right? And those gaps, the remaining gaps, are the bugs. And those bugs are the small syntactic errors, like off by one errors. All right? So in terms of our... Oops. In terms of our mutation quantity variable K, research has shown that we, can, we only need one mutation to capture this area, this class of bugs introduced by experienced programmers. Okay? Now let's talk about K, why K? So in, in, in software engineering and engineering and, sci and science in general, we, we name things to be able to talk about, about them with, with other people. So the, when there's only one mutation, we call the mutant a first order mutant, okay? If there's two mutations, we call it a second order mutant. And in general, K mutations leads to a K order mutant. So K, the reason why it's so cryptic, K, it's just easy to communicate k-order, like, like the arity of a relation, unary, binary, ternary, k -ary, Okay. So first-order mutants are also called low-order mutants because that, that class is very important. Okay. But then the rest of the class, right, the, the rest of the bugs, the rest of the mutants capture, uh, uh, are, are called um, uh, higher-order mutants, okay, and they capture the rest of the bugs. So why would we ever want to have high-order mutants? Well, if you remember, I said that competent programmer hypothesis is one of two pillars making the foundation for mutation analysis. The other pillar is called the coupling effect. Okay? And this is the, I call it the nasty bug effect. Because it says that the, the, the rest of the bugs are actually combinations of the effects of these small errors introduced by experienced programmers. And the reason I call it the, the nasty bug effect is because these are the types of bugs that you're investigating and all of a sudden they disappear. And you didn't do anything, but it turns out that someone made a change somewhere in the code that caused the effect or the coupling to disappear. Okay? So this has also been shown by, by decades of research to be a valid hypothesis. That's why these two are, are the pillars of mutation analysis. In terms of our variable k, the mutation quantity, we only need between two and five mutations to capture this, this area of, of bugs, this class of bugs. Okay? So we've seen now why mutation analysis works and why it's a perfect match to assess the regression detection capability of our, of our tests. Okay? Because if we have one contributor committing code for a bug fix or, or a feature, then we have the competent hopefully, competent programmer hypothesis, in effect, right? And then to a certain degree, the coupling effect. Now, if, if we compound that with many contributors, we have both hypotheses uh, in effect. So what? So why is it better than code coverage? Why should you start using it more than code coverage? So let me show you some results of my research. 
What you're seeing here is called uh, correlations, linear correlations or Pearson correlations. Okay, so let's let's focus on the on the correlation between code coverage and mutation score. Now, uh, correlations can have Pearson correlations can have two maximum effects, two maximum strengths, negative one and positive one. Okay, a negative one is a one-to-one -one downward correspondence, and a positive one is a one-to-one -one upward correspondence. All right, you can see here it's um, positive. It's pretty close to one, meaning that the higher your mutation score, the higher your code coverage. Okay. But the opposite is not true. Okay, you can see that the cluster of test suites that are already achieving 100% code coverage, code coverage is on the is on the x-axis, by the way, is only achieving a mere 75% mutation score. Okay, so mutation score is a much stronger, more reliable metric than code coverage. But we can we can flip it also, and we can see the positive side. We can see that. The cluster of suites already achieving a mere, or only achieving a mere 75% mutation score, are achieving already 100% code coverage. Now let's look at that correlation between code coverage and test redundancy. So it's a negative correlation, and it's very strong, very close to one as well. What that means is that the higher your test redundancy, the lower your code coverage, or rather, the lower the effect of code coverage. Okay? Now, it turns out that the test redundancy is a smell. It's an indication of a problem, of a deeper problem with the quality of our tests. Okay? Now, this doesn't explain why. You'll see why in, in the next slide. But what this explains is that code coverage is highly susceptible to redundancy in our tests. Okay. So to talk about why test redundancy is a smell, let's talk about something that we really care about, bugs, and likelihood of bugs, right? So you can see the correlation on your right, on your left, on your right, my left, with uh, code, uh, likelihood of bugs and code coverage, okay? It's a negative correlation, meaning that the higher the code coverage, the lower the likelihood of bugs. And that's expected. That makes sense, right? Well, unfortunately, the correlation between likelihood of bugs and test redundancy is practically the same, but it's positive. The higher your redundancy, the higher your likelihood of bugs. And I was, that, that surprised me, okay? But the, the results of the research surprised me. I wasn't expecting that to happen. I, I thought that having redundancy in our tests was only a good thing. They, it, they, they maximized the, effect of our, the effectiveness of our test suites, right? But it turns out that's not the case. That's why test redundancy is a smell, all right? Because they increase somehow the likelihood of bugs. And the way I've, I've come to explain it and understand it is by way of analogy. So suppose that you need to, one of your tires, your car or your, your bicycle, your motorcycle, is underinflated, and you need to inflate your tire. Now, suppose that you want to, that you decide to overinflate your tire, in the hopes that you won't have to inflate anytime soon. Nothing wrong will happen, right? Well, the problem with that is that not only do you decrease the traction of your tire when you overinflate, and therefore you spend more energy getting from point A to point B, but you also decrease the life of your tire. Okay. In an analogous way, if we, when we overinflate our tests, so to speak, we're introducing technical debt. We're over-testing an area of our product, of our application, and leaving under others under-tested or completely untested. And my hypothesis is that's where the bugs are creeping in. That's why the effect of co coverage goes down. Okay. So let's look at correlations between mutation scores, as a focal point, and, and the other two metrics. You can see that these correlations, so of course you have the, the same correlation as before between code coverage and mutation score, 0.86. That's the same as before, and we already talked about that.
But what about code, uh, test redundancy? It's still negative, meaning that mutation score is still susceptible to redundancy in our tests, but not as susceptible as code coverage. All right. So now let's talk about how to apply mutation analysis. Okay, hopefully right by now you're inspired to, to see how to apply it. So I'm listing here several mutation analysis tools for several languages. The first two are for uh, Ruby. Second, uh, second two are for Java. Then the last one is for, C, for .NET. Um, now, for my research, unfortunately, I wasn't able to use the, re the, the Ruby ones, the first two, because Heckle it was already out of support in the, in the version of Ruby I was using, and Mutant was a release candidate. Okay, but, of course, now Mutant has been released, and you can use it. Um, but I want to just want to say that so I, I wasn't able to, to use those, those tools, so I had to write my own, basically, in a way that was, as silly as that sounds, in a way that was fast and accurate in cross-language, because I, I needed to use it for Ruby and Java and Python and, and this and that. Okay? So if you're interested, uh, check it out. Now, the, the major remark I've heard from people against mutation analysis is that it's very difficult and very slow. Okay? I just want to share with you some guidelines for a painless way to apply mutation analysis in your, at your work. All right? So first guideline is you want to have passing tests. Now, this is not a chicken and egg problem. This, you don't have to have correct passing tests. You just need to have passing tests. Okay? Because if you, if you get a mutation score of zero, you can only go up. Right? You're good. Now, the issue with mutants. Okay? Let, me, let me show you. We, we left the mutation engine running for 50 mutants. I can get my cursor back. All right, and you can see now the mutation score is much more accurate than before. But you can see it was actually pretty fast, too. In less than five minutes, we have a good mutation score for one test suite. Okay? So if you follow these, these uh, practices, these guidelines, you'll be fine. So the reason we decided on 50 mutants, okay, was for a, for a very good reason. In my research... I had to run 10,000 mutants per test suite to get a very, very low error margin. But you don't have to go that far. You can take advantage of a property of statistics called the, the um, central limit theorem, which says that with, with a sufficient sample size, the average value starts becoming apparent. Okay? And that sufficient sample size, for, for our intents and purposes, is 50, of course, the higher sample size, the better. And you want to you wanna focus on low-order mutants okay, to, to, capture, to make sure that your tests detect those class of bugs introduced by experienced programmers. But you also want to experiment with high-order mutants to make sure that your tests can detect the nasty bugs. Now, there's a cycle for mutation analysis, just like with refactoring, right? Red-green refactor. Mutation analysis is, is, is very easy if you follow this cycle. So you mutate like you saw before. Then you score your test, right, like you just saw. And based on that, you can actually improve it. Because for every uh, live mutant, it means that your tests are, have a hole related to that mutant. Okay? So, for example, if, if uh, you recall, we, we had the off by one error. And if our tests didn't detect it, no, no test failed, it means that we have a blatant hole right there, a weak spot, and that's where we need to focus. So mutation analysis gives us a really good metric to use, but also a really good guide and tells us where exactly our tests need work. Okay? And last guideline, uh, a word on, on coupling. You really want to follow good engineering practices. You want to have low coupled code. All right? with, with highly coupled code, the mutation score is really, really low and effectively useless. But I guess on the flip side, you, can, you, you might be able to use uh, mutation analysis as a tool to detect highly coupled code. I'm not, sh I'm not sure if that would work, though, but anyway. All right, so, so now I hope that, that you feel empowered to start using this, this uh, 
really old technique, but really, really useful technique, okay? To actually start engineering your tests so that they can have the quality that you want them to have and so, so that they give you confidence, all right? And, and I hope that you also feel inspired to start bumping code coverage down the hierarchy, okay? Because it's a, it's a second-order metric. It's useful, but not for the way we, we, we wanted to use, okay? We, we wanted to tell us the quality of our tests. That's not going to happen. All right? Thank you.